So uh, thank you so much for having me here today. I am a radiologist. I do breast imaging. I've been in, in Todd cancer for a very long time, almost 20 years. Um, I'm also a two-time breast cancer survivor. And, um, and so I'm especially connected to all of you. And some of you um, have been my mentor or my sister's mentor. So I'm very grateful and, 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 and really happy to be here. But I'm here to talk about something else, which is, so you guys know that I'm into screening, because when we find cancers early, we cure them, and then we're all here to celebrate that. It's when we can't find cancers late that things don't work out. So I'm involved in the GRAIL Pathfinder II clinical trial. It's at all of the memorial care sites. We're one of 26 centers in the United States that has that trial. So in the United States, you know, uh, we screen for colon, breast, prostate, cervix, and sometimes lung. But for most cancers, we don't even do any screening. So those are the ones that are found late. Those are our friends who die of prostate, of ovarian cancer that were never found. So there's this company called Illumina. They are the global leader in DNA sequencing. So they are the people who have the biggest data bank of uh, DNA. And DNA is like the brain of a cell. It tells the cell what to do. And when you have a cancer, you have something in that DNA that's not working. They started their uh, testing with uh, the verified prenatal screening. I don't know if you guys are, know that, but women nowadays, unlike me, when they're pregnant, they get a blood test and that baby who has abnormal DNA sheds that into their bloodstream of the mom, and that's uh, how they find out if you have a kid with a trisomy or any other genetic diseases. But they, did, they noticed when they were doing that that there were a couple of moms that had funky genetic stuff, and it was that they had some kind of cancer, and that's the origin of this test. So it's a single blood draw. It's not FDA approved just yet, it tests for 50 kinds of cancers, and right now it's available to anybody who wants to pay $950, uh, but insurance doesn't pay for it. So the whole point of this trial is to get a lot of data so that um, we can get go to the FDA, get it approved, and we're looking for anybody over 50, and now we've closed people over 80, so um, between 50 and 80. Um, so again, this explains a little bit what I talked about. You have a person who has cancer somewhere in their, in their body, and those cancer cells shed into the bloodstream. And so we take uh, the, the blood. So for anybody who volunteers for this trial, you would just simply go get a blood draw, and, um, and that would go through this kind of AI um, machine that will let us know whether you have a cancer signal detected or no cancer signal detected. Um, it is especially good for uh, more of the aggressive cancers. So you see to the right are the ones that it does better with. I'm especially excited about ovarian, pancreas, um, things that we're not testing for just yet routinely. So the first uh, time they tested this out, and, and now the numbers are even better, um, it's n almost 90% accurate in predicting uh, where the cancer is. And uh, out of every 200 people that get this test, there'll be two that have a positive test. Um, so it, 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 and the likelihood that that test is incorrect is extremely low. So anyways, this is, uh, if anybody's interested in, in helping out and being part of this trial, um, again, we're looking for everybody between 50 and 80 who has not had cancer in the past three years. And uh, for anybody here who's involved in like either the uh, black community, Hispanic community, we are especially looking uh, for people who don't participate in clinical trials, right? You can fill your clinical trials real quick with uh, white women because uh, white women want to participate in clinical trials, but it seems like men and uh, uh, a lot of ethnicities are, are a little bit more, um, I guess, uh, less weary. And so anybody who, who has a connections in that community and wants to help, I'm happy to talk anywhere. Okay, well, thank you. Good morning. It is a privilege to see you all here and to uh, talk to you about what has been the passion of my life for the past 35 years. 
Um, and, and I've been here for over 20 years now, and uh, so that is so that is a great place to d develop my passion. And what is my passion? Psychosocial oncology, which is what? Uh, psychosocial oncology is really recognizing the connection between our uh, what's happening in our psyche, with our emotions, with our thoughts, beliefs, but also in our social environment, which is our families and a greater community, um, and how it affects our experience of going through cancer. And we know that technology of treating cancer is very similar in all advanced uh, countries um, because we are, it is driven by research. And exactly what Dr. Stipek was talking about, we need the research because that helps us to find out what are the most effective treatments for different types of cancer and for different types of people, right? And so we, the treat, cancer treatment is driven by protocols. Uh, so the, whether you are treated here or at UCLA <laughs> or Cedar Sinai, City of Hope, uh, and other places all over the United States or Europe or Japan, Australia, uh, and uh, you are going to get the very similar treatment for, for your type of cancer for, for, for you. Um, but what is really determining the quality of your cancer journey how you experience going through that treatment is really based on psychosocial services that are available to you during that journey. So we are really proud because uh, here at Long Beach Memorial we have multiple different uh, psychosocial services. We have social workers, we have nurse navigators, we have, um, uh, yes, we have uh, mind-body oncology coach, we have different programs for newly diagnosed patients. For um, uh, we have programs for uh, actually we are partnering with um, a, a support community, cancer support community, to expand those services. So they are groups for um, families and support people. Uh, um, how to get support and also beat the odds, which is and boost the odds programs. Uh, the, the first one being inviting both patients and their f uh, family members and friends to participate and learn how to uh, get skills, um, how to deal with cancer, and boost the odds, which is from cancer survivor to life thriver, which is learning the different uh, lifestyle modification uh, skills uh, in the area of nutrition, physical activity, uh, play and laughter, because this is very important, as well as connection to nature, and so on. And why it is we were able to develop this? Because of Team Spirit. What is Team Spirit? Uh, I think it was 22 years ago, um, women who were treated for breast cancer uh, here at Todd Cancer Institute. No, it was 30 years ago. Am I correct? My goodness, it was a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it was 20, 22 years ago, yes. 22 years ago. Um, women who were treated here, they noticed that they were not getting any psychosocial support. And they started a nonprofit and called it Team Spirit. These were women with breast cancer and, and uh, ovarian cancer, and that is how it started. And they funded the first position for a social worker, right? They funded the first position for the first nurse navigator, for, uh, for nurse practitioner. And they funded a, a position for Erin Zomerville, our mind-body oncology coach. So they were funding all those things through fundraising. So because what, once a year they were doing this Team Spirit walk. They were, you see the problem is that these services are not reimbursed by insurance. At that time they were not required. And now they are required to get accredited. But insurance still doesn't pay for it. So the only way to maintain these services is through fundraising. So we have this yearly fundraiser called Team Spirit. And we continue, even though many of the founding uh, 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 members of that program are not with us anymore, but some of them are still. And uh, so we are really always happy to continue that tradition. So. You are all invited to join Team Spirit. Here's the flyer, and you will see this flyer on the table, and here's the QR code. 
uh, that you'll be able to scan. Or, or simply you can go to memorialcare.org slash team spirit uh, and you will get there. Um, so, so what is it? It is, you know, it is a fundraiser, yes, but more importantly, it is an opportunity to get together. It is a community event. You see, psychosocial is also the social part is that we are in a very dedicated community. You see, next month, uh, July 10th, that is when we are going to be formally opening the registration for Team Spirit. We are also going to be celebrating the 10th anniversary of Todd Cancer Pavilion, this beautiful building that we have. And it was built with significant investment from the community. So, so the, without the community, we wouldn't have the services, and without the services, our community wouldn't know what to do for us, right? So here you know, if you can support us, and how you can support us, you know what? Just sign up, create a team, or join the existing team, um, and then talk about it to your friends. That is a wonderful community event. We are all getting together on this uh, on the uh, bike path uh, on the beach. That is a wonderful place. So we all encourage you to to join us, and it is fun event. Um, also, uh, I wanted the beat the odds program was converted into an app, and you will have some. Uh, uh, and we are actually now uh, uh, doing a tri clinical trial. How effective is this app uh, in comparison to regular psychosocial? services that are available here. And this, uh, so we are doing the clinical trial and those who, of you women, that is only for women, for now, we have another version coming out for men, um, but those who are in active treatment, they can sign up for our clinical trial. Uh, the, the, that color of a flyer is also there available. So uh, join us for Team Spirit Walk. We hope that you are going to be happy with us, um, and so remember the date, Saturday, October the 21st, right? Thank you very much. So like Randall was saying, I'm really excited to be able to share our on oncology rehab services with you because it's promoting taking back control of your body. I am a 14-year breast cancer survivor, and I know when I went through cancer, I did not like being told I could not do something. I had personal goals I wanted to still be able to do, and that's what our rehab team does. We help promote you and your well-being so that you can achieve your personal activity goals. We are here for you throughout the continuum of care, whether it be at the very start of your treatment, during your treatment, years after your treatment, our team is made up of physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists. And I wanted to educate you today about, each, about what each of those disciplines can provide for you. Education is key to being able to advocate for what you need. Sometimes we have to be the ones that push. You push for yourself. You advocate for yourself. You advocate for your friends and for your family members. So let's get started with physical therapy. As you can see, we have um, services sometimes before surgery, sometimes right after surgery or during radiation chemotherapy, and on into survivorship. So um, we do have community classes in yoga and mat pilates. But what physical therapists do is we restore your motion we rebuild your strength, we release scar tissue, we build endurance to combat cancer-related fatigue, we provide assessment and education on lymphedema, we reduce problems that might arise from chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy of your hands and feet, we work a lot on balance, we also assist in pain management, and new to our program is pelvic health. Your pelvic muscle function absolutely can be affected by your medical intervention for your cancer care. It could be due to hormone therapy, surgery, radiation. If you have experienced any urinary bowel leakage, we call that incontinence, if you feel that you have increased bladder or bowel frequency, urgency, if you have pelvic pain, sexual dysfunction, uterine prolapse, rectal prolapse, 
there is help for you. We need to get comfortable talking about our pelvic health. It is often an area that we are all afraid to bring up to our doctors, but it's important. It really impacts our day-to-day -day life. Next, we're gonna talk about occupational therapy. <laughs> occupational therapy will address the fine motor skills that get affected by chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. How many of you have dropped items? How many of you have difficulty getting dressed? <laughs> or cooking, typing, writing. Well, occupational therapists can help you with all of those things. They also can provide resources for adaptive tools to make your self-care activities, your household chores a lot easier. And another thing they address is cancer-related fatigue by teaching you energy conservation techniques. And lastly, I wanna to talk to you about speech therapy. So we all have heard about chemo brain, but did you know there's help for that? <laughs> so our speech therapists can help you address difficulties with reading, comprehension, organization, memory, concentration, attention. They also work on voice disorders and swallowing difficulties. So how do you access this? Any of your doctors can write a referral to our oncology rehab services. We have flyers at our table, back where Gay is sitting. Um, if you have more questions, please come over during the lunchtime and talk to us. There is help out there, and again, we want you advocating for yourselves, your friends, and your family. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me this morning. I'm really looking forward to talking. I know some of you may have some questions, so feel free to jot them down as I'm talking, and I'm happy to answer them afterwards. Um, I will try and make this as brief and painless as possible because I'm right before lunch, so we'll, um, we'll get this going smoothly. All right. Um, so the objectives of the talk today is hopefully for you to have an understanding of the basic mechanism of how genetics and cancer work together, to have an understanding of how different types of genetic tests can be utilized. There's different, lots of different kinds of genetic tests, and they've all been lumped together just to talk about genetic testing, but there are actually a lot of different types, and it's very confusing to be able to determine which genetic test somebody is actually talking about. Um, and then lastly, to be able to identify when and why it may be appropriate to ask for a referral for genetic counseling and genetic testing from your provider. All right, so in order to talk about this, I will first do a little bit of basic science. Uh, so you're going to go back to your high school biology or college biology days for a few minutes. Um, in order for me to talk about the types of testing that we have in terms of genetics, and then talking a little bit more about common myths of genetic testing and how those might not necessarily be correct. Okay, so here for the basics. So cancer is actually a genetic disease, meaning that uh, as our cells divide, as our bodies grow, cells can accumulate a lot of different changes, genetic changes within our DNA, um, and that is what causes our cells to be able to grow out of control and lose the ability to function and differentiate how they're supposed to act, and eventually they just start kind of going on their own different path. Um, but the tricky thing is that not all cancer is inherited. So there's only a very small percentage of cancer that we term inherited cancers. Those that are born with a predisposition that can develop certain types of cancers over their lifetime. Most cancers, if we look at that, uh, this pie chart here, most cancers, about 75 to 85 percent of them are in that sporadic, just random category. And the biggest factors that enter into this, one is age. As we get older, our bodies are exposed to thousands and thousands of different things, and just natural wear and tear leads to those cells being able to start growing into cancers. Uh, sometimes lifestyle, uh, BMI, gynecologic history, but a lot of it is just unknown. We don't really know what all of the causes of cancers are in those individuals. Um, and so here, there's only that small percentage, about 5 to 10 percent, have these underlying genetic predispositions that causes individuals to have cancer. 
So again, going back to those high school biology days, you may remember that our bodies are made up of these tiny microscopic structures called cells. Inside of our cells, we have these other structures called chromosomes. And those are packed of all of this genetic information in the form of DNA. If we were to unravel that chromosome here, we have this strand of DNA. And all along that strand of DNA, we have these chunks of information that we call genes. And every gene is kind of like a step-by-step -step direction to make a protein in our body. And all of the thousands of different proteins in our bodies work together and operate together. And those are how our cells can function and how our bodies can do all of the daily activities that they need to do. So again, thinking about genes, our genes are kind of like recipes. If I have a cake recipe, I need to be able to copy that cake recipe down step by step by step. I'm following that recipe step by step by step. And in the end, I get a protein. And sometimes what happens is our genes can get spelling mistakes in them, and we call those mutations. If there's a mutation within the gene, then that protein that it's trying to make is not going to be able to work properly. So again, thinking about that recipe. If I'm copying down my mom's famous cake recipe and I forget to write down the sugar, and I'm following that recipe without thinking, I know that that cake at the end is not going to taste very well because I forgot a really important ingredient. And those are exactly like our genes. As they're being replicated from cell to cell, sometimes they can have mistakes develop in them, mutations develop in them. And as we get more and more mistakes, then again, those cells can start growing into those cancer cells. So this is just, again, that basic mechanism of what happens in cancer. Here we have a, a whole bunch of just cells that are doing what they need to do. But then one of those cells develops a first mutation, a first hit. And after that first hit, that cell starts to develop its own line of other cells, but over time, as it gets more and more hits to that DNA, eventually it starts to be able to grow out of control and grow into a cancer. Um, and so some individuals are born with all of their cells without any mutations, and then those just develop over time. Those are the sporadic types of cancers. But some individuals are actually born with all of their cells already having a first hit. Those are the types of inherited cancers that you have. And so sometimes when we think about the inherited cancers, because they already have that first hit mutation, they're kind of ahead of the game a little bit. So we might see cancers developing at younger ages. We might see cancers developing in more uncommon parts of the body than we usually would, again, just because they already have that first mutation in all of their cells instead of waiting for that to happen over time. All right, so now there are two different kinds of areas where we can get mutations in. And this is kind of important when thinking about the different kinds of genetic tests that we have. The first kinds of mutations that we can, uh, oops, sorry, clicked the wrong button. Hold on one second. All right, there we go. The first kinds of mutations that we can have are mutations that we call somatic mutations. And what that means is that these happen in what we call non-germline tissues. Basically, any part of the body that is not your egg or your sperm are non-germline tissues. So if they're developing in your breast tissue, in your colon tissue, in your skin tissue, those are these somatic mutations that happen. And eventually, as the somatic mutations build up, they can develop into a tumor in your body somewhere. But then we have these other types of mutations, the mutations that you can be born with that are present in the egg or the sperm, and those are the types of mutations that can be inherited, that can be passed from generation to generation. So when somebody develops a breast cancer in a somatic mutation, let's say a woman in her 30s develops a breast cancer and she has a child after that diagnosis, she cannot pass that mutation on to a child because that's only happening in her breast tissue. It's not happening in her eggs. And so therefore, it's not something that can be passed from generation to generation. 
But if you have a mutation in an egg cell or a sperm cell, those are the genes that get passed on to the next generation. And so those are the types of cancers that we can see having those hereditary patterns where we can see that happening from multiple generations. Okay, so now the second part of the talk discussing what types of genetic tests are there. So we can separate those genetic tests into these two separate categories, the somatic testing as well as the germline testing. And so this is where, again, it can get very confusing when your doctor is talking about genetic testing because there are so many different types of genetic tests out there. One of those main categories in terms of those somatic tests is we also call it, there's lots of different terms for all of these, but sometimes doctors will call it tumor testing, sometimes they'll call it genomic testing, they might call it a liquid biopsy. There are lots of different kinds of ways that we can discuss this. But the main ca uh, kind of pro um, process of this is the physicians and your providers want to do testing on your tumor itself and that will have implications for prognosis and treatment decisions because we're really trying to guide our cancer treatment to be a little bit more precise what types of driver mutations do individuals have within their own cancer, and how can we use that for certain medications to be able to combat that specific cancer? Um, sometimes that can also be helpful in clinical trials, as well as what Dr. Stipik had talked about, that in terms of future screening, like the gallery test, that is a type of somatic genetic testing that we have done, because your cancer cells shed off that specific genetic information, and we can now pick that up with a blood test to be able to screen for all of those different cancers. Um, and so those are kind of the, the purposes of the somatic testing. So then there's this totally separate category of genetic testing that we call germline testing. Now, a lot of providers use the term genetic test to talk about germline testing. But again, it's only one type of genetic test. So it can be very confusing when you hear this, these terms a lot of the time. The biggest kind of term for uh, germline testing is BRCA testing. So a lot of women who've had breast cancer or ovarian cancer may be familiar with BRCA testing. That is germline testing because what we're trying to do is see, are you born with some type of predisposition that could explain your own cancer history? Could that be important for you in terms of maybe answering some of those questions as to why you were diagnosed with your cancer. Why do you have a family history of cancer? Um, this can sometimes help with treatment decisions. If an individual knows that they have a genetic predisposition to develop their cancer, sometimes they decide to go on different pathways in terms of different surgeries, different screenings. And so this can be important in terms of those treatment decisions. Um, and screening recommendations for their doctors and their providers, they may want to make sure that we're screening you a little bit differently, even if you've had a breast cancer, if you have an underlying genetic predisposition for that breast cancer, should we be following other parts of your body that could have that predisposition as well? Um, and so that's really important for a patient and their providers. Um, and then key is because we know that germline cell, those eggs, that sperm, they get passed to the next generation. And so this can have a lot of familial implications. This is not just your own information, your genes are shared amongst your family, your siblings, your parents, your children. And so that's where all of the sharing of information can really be helpful and can really be important for them. Okay, so now that third topic that we're going to kind of address is uh, hopefully answering and uh, kind of, um, breaking down some of those myths that can come with genetic testing. So the first is, if you had negative BRCA testing, you'll never need genetic testing again. All right. 
Um, as Dr. Stipik had mentioned earlier, and uh, as Randall had mentioned earlier, basically every year we get new information about our genes and treatments and different things. Um, we're constantly, the laboratories are constantly looking at, are there new genes that we didn't know that existed 10 years ago that maybe we can find can have these underlying hereditary predispositions now? Are there new ways that we can screen for those genes, can we test those genes differently where in the past we may not have been able to pick up a mutation, but now we may have the technology to be able to pick up those mutations. Um, and so here, this is just a timeline of the evolution of genetic testing for hereditary breast cancer. Um, if we think about where this all started, this is a very new science. This has really been started in 1985. So all things considered, this is only a 40-year kind of a science that we have available. Um, and so here, in 1988, that was when the search for hereditary causes of breast cancer started. And then in 1994, that was when the first BRCA gene was sequenced, that BRCA1 gene. BRCA just stands for breast cancer 1. Um, genetics and scientists are very clever in terms of their namings of a lot of different genes. Um, and so we have, over time, then here in 1996, there was a clinical trial to be able to start screening for families that have BRCA1 and BRCA2 or BRCA mutations. Here in 2006, there was another um, type of a test, still part of the BRCA testing, that we call BART, which stands for rearrangement testing. And basically, what we found here is that in 1994, when we sequenced the gene, so again, going back to that recipe analogy, in that um, sequencing here, we were looking for spelling changes. Did we have any spelling changes that was incorrect in that recipe that could have made that protein not work? But we didn't know until 2000, 2006 that there could be large chunks of the gene that were missing. And if we're spell checking it, you're not gonna realize that you actually have a large chunk of that gene that's missing. So now, all of a sudden, in 2006, that's when we started to find that out. And so that was 10 years um, that that second part of the BRCA test wasn't really even identified. And then in 2012, that really started to kickstart things where now we are um, kind of looking at these multi-gene panels. So instead of just doing one gene by one gene by one gene, now the laboratories have technology to find lots of different genes all at the same time. When somebody had genetic testing in the late 1990s, they had to sequence each gene individually. It was very cost um, heavy. It was very manual labor, and it, those genetic tests were extremely expensive. But in 2012, with the multi-gene panels, now we are able to start screening for lots of different genes all at the same time, and that drastically helped to reduce the cost of the genetic testing. And then the other big thing is that here in 2013, there was actually a Supreme Court ruling saying that there were certain laboratories that held patents for genetic testing. So uh, if you had BRCA testing done in the 1990s and early 2000s, you could only get that done in one place in the United States. But in 2013, they lost their patent to say, you cannot patent gene uh, genes for individuals. And so now, all of a sudden, you started to, to get a lot of different laboratories offering BRCA testing, and that greatly enhanced the competition amongst laboratories. It brought the cost down for the patients, and it really helped being able to make this genetic test more accessible to the general population. Now, this is just a sample of the genes that we test for. Um, so this is a total of 47 genes here. Oops, sorry, I keep clicking the wrong thing. Let me go back. There we go. Um, this is just a total of 47 genes here. These are the types of cancer risks that are associated with each of those genes. And so now, if you think about it, we can look for genes that are associated with breast and gyne cancers, endocrine cancers, gastrointestinal cancers, urinary tract cancers, hematologic malignancies, nervous and brain system cancers, prostate cancers, sarcomas, skin cancers. This is only part of the list. 
we can test for hundreds of different genes depending on you know, different uh, conversations that people have, different family histories that people have. So the important key takeaway for that one myth is that, and this is a very general and ballpark number, but if you have had, haven't had genetic testing since about 2014, you may want to go back, see if you can find a copy of that genetic test, see if you can see if your doctor has a copy of that genetic test, because you may qualify for update testing since things have changed so much. I would say that 10-year point is probably that good um, point where a lot of people before 2014 may not have had multi-panel testing. Um, you may not have had that BART B rearrangement BRCA testing. So that's kind of a good, a good cutoff somewhere around there. Um, and also ask your doctors every five years, 10 years, if there have been any new developments in genetics that you may qualify for. Again, because we're learning all of these different things, there are so many opportunities to kind of reassess and readdress your genes over time. Um, and then also inform your doctor and provider if there are any new diagnoses of cancers in your family. Because sometimes if the, you had only been tested for genes that are associated with breast and gynecologic cancers, maybe if a family member developed a colon cancer, there could be an inherited colon predisposition uh, kind of a, a family that we wouldn't have addressed previously, but with new family information, maybe that would be something that your physician would circle back on. Um, and there's also new screening recommendations, even for individuals who do test positive for some of these hereditary predispositions, the guidelines are always changing. So in the past, we knew that the BRCA genes had had an association with pancreatic cancer, but there weren't really strong guidelines, recommendations to screen for pancreatic cancer. And it's just within the past two years that now physicians are saying, okay, well, if you have a BRCA mutation, maybe talk to your physicians about adding on pancreatic screening as well as screening for other types of cancer risks. Um, also for prostate cancer, those guidelines have now just recently come about. So it helps to kind of bring that conversation up with your physicians and talk to them about, is there anything else that I should be knowing about my genetic test and what that means for me? Okay, second myth. Uh, the genetic test will cost you thousands of dollars. So luckily, as I said, when um, the Supreme Court ruled against that patent that one laboratory had, we know that um, the cost of the test has come down significantly. Um, and because the cost of the testing has come down significantly, most insurance providers are pretty good about covering. So there's, it's very rare for you to spend thousands of dollars for genetic testing. Usually if you go through insurance, you may have an out-of-pocket cost of a few hundred dollars, probably tops. And a lot of the laboratories also offer cash price pay options where you don't have to go through insurance and it's still a, a fairly manageable amount. So this isn't something that's gonna cost thousands of dollars. Um, and because the cost of the genetic testing has come down a lot, the laboratories and the insurance providers have also expanded who they will cover in terms of genetic testing. So just about five years ago, it used to be that if you didn't have a family history of breast cancer, you would qualify for testing if you were diagnosed with breast cancer 45 and under at worthy ages. But now they've expanded that to say, okay, well, if you're 50 and under, you can qualify for genetic testing even if you don't have a family history. They've expanded who in your family we look at to, to see about these genetic tests. Um, if you've had a triple negative breast cancer, it used to be we would only offer testing for triple negative breast cancers if you were diagnosed at 60 or below. Now we're looking at triple negative breast cancers at any age. So again, these guidelines are constantly changing. Insurance companies are much more willing to cover these genetic tests than they were in the past. Okay, myth number three, men don't need to get genetic testing. 
Uh, this information is important for males as well as females because we know mutations can be passed from generation to generation and it doesn't matter if it comes from a paternal line, a father's line, or if it comes from that maternal mother's line. Those mutations can be passed from regardless of if it's a mother's family or a father's family. In the past, when we used to learn about the BRCA gene specifically, especially in the late 1980s, early 1990s, because we only tested clusters of female breast cancers in families, we thought it was only maternally linked. We thought it was something that was only passed from mother to daughter. Now we're aware that that's not the case. We can get it father to daughter, father to son, and so those can be passed to the men as well as, as, well as women. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we also know that um, the BRCA gene specifically, again, we're not only looking at breast and ovarian cancers for those genes, but now we're starting to screen for other cancers like prostate cancer and pancreatic cancers. Some genes that we look at can have risks for colon cancers um, or for other cancers that men can have an increased risk for as well as, well as women. Um, all right, and myth number four, you have to have a genetic mutation to be considered having a high lifetime risk for breast cancer. So here is kind of where we think back to that pie chart where a majority of cancers, a majority of all cancers, breast cancers, ovarian cancers are in that sporadic, just random category. And only a small percentage, that five to 10% are hereditary. So most people who develop a cancer don't actually have a family history of cancer. But we don't wanna ignore somebody's family history even if their test is negative. If their underlying germline genetic test is negative, we don't wanna discard somebody's family history. Um, and so for people who have a family history of breast cancer, even if they test negative for a BRCA gene or if they test negative for some of these other hereditary predispositions for breast cancer, they're not at that general population risk of developing a breast cancer, but they're not at that high risk, significantly high risk in terms of carrying a BRCA mutation. They're kind of somewhere in between. And so this is where we do a lot of different risk models. When you go into the breast center and you get your mammogram done, they'll do something called a TC model, which stands for Tyre Cusick model. They look at your gynecologic history. They look at your family history. They look at your um, other information and say, should we be screening you a little bit closer? Do you qualify for breast MRIs on top of your annual mammograms? Let's make sure that we're screening everybody. We don't wanna underscreen people. We don't wanna overscreen people. We wanna try and find the right spot for them in terms of being able to pick up cancers. And that's, that's it. These are my three little ones. My husband's uh, taking care of them today. Um, so please let me know if you've got questions. If you can, I, some people may have general questions about their own genetic test. I know there was somebody in the back who had a question for Dr. Stipic. I'm gonna kind of answer that question. Um, and then if you can think of anything else, I'll, um, I'll do that. So hold on, let me go back a little bit. And I can answer that question about the uncertain result. Okay. So a lot of times when somebody has genetic testing done, Again, think of it as that recipe book. So the laboratories are looking at all of these different recipes to see if you have any spelling change in that recipe that may influence that protein's ability to function. Now, if I'm copying down a recipe and I don't include my sugar in that cake recipe, just by looking at the recipe, if I put my thinking cap on and I look at it, I'm gonna know for sure this isn't looking right, this is not gonna turn out like cake, there's no sugar in that recipe. And so when a laboratory sees some of those obvious mistakes, those obvious mutations, that's when they can determine, okay, this can be what we call pathogenic. This can be something that we know is gonna be a harmful mutation, a harmful mistake within those genes. But let's say as I'm screening and I'm doing the genetic test, I'm looking at that recipe and instead of the normal one cup of sugar that I typically see in that cake recipe, I see only a half a cup of sugar in somebody's recipe. Now I have my thinking cap on and I'm like, well, I don't know. If I have a half amount of sugar in that cake, is that cake still gonna be okay? 
probably it might be a little bit less sweet but for the most part this is probably okay but I don't have any proof of that and that's where some of these inconclusive results from genetic tests can come about you may have also gotten results that we call variants of uncertain clinical significance or VUSs for short and so basically what that is as the laboratory is sequencing your genes they find a small spelling change within that gene and the laboratory just doesn't know is that small spelling change enough so that that protein doesn't work properly. Most of the time it works just fine and so that's why if you've had some of those variants of uncertain significance we treat those results as negative because most likely these small changes that you have within your DNA are just unique to your family history and unique to your ancestry and don't cause any damage downstream to your protein. But because the laboratory doesn't know that with 100% certainty, that's, they can't call it a negative because they're just not 100% sure about that. And so they can't call it a positive because it doesn't look like a positive pathogenic mutation, so they call it this in-between, this variant of uncertain significance. We do get variants of uncertain significance in individuals who come from populations that don't undergo genetic testing very often. And so if your family is from Laos or Cambodia or from Uruguay or Mexico or different parts of Africa, unfortunately those populations of individuals don't have the same access to genetic testing as the European populations do. And so we tend to get variants of uncertain significance more in individuals of minority ethnic groups than we do in the Caucasian populations. We can still get those variants in Caucasians, but sometimes it just takes a while to test more and more people to be able to figure out what all of these different changes within our DNA mean. Because we all have changes in our DNA, that's what makes one person unique from anybody else. Most of the changes that we have don't cause any increased risk for cancers, but sometimes they do, and so we're still trying to figure out how to determine all of that information. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so there is a gene yeah, hold on, let me see if I can go back to that. And Karen, you'll repeat the question. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, um, uh, and can you tell me your name? Aaron. So Aaron had asked a question about, he saw on the chart there was a gene called the TP53 gene. I'll go back to that. This is an incredibly rare gene that somebody can have, a mutation that you can have, that you can be born with. Hold on, sorry. Uh, there we go. That has pretty much everything checked off here. Uh, TP53 is um, uh, uh, when you're born with a mutation within TP53, that is uh, uh, called a, a specific syndrome called Lee Fraumini syndrome. It is an incredibly rare syndrome, but basically, individuals who have Lee Fraumini can have up to 90 to 95% chance to get some type of cancer over their lifetime. Um, and so we follow those people very, very closely. We wanna limit their radiation exposure. Um, usually families have very uh, strong family histories of cancer from generation to generation, and we can detect them. Um, I've been here at the Todd Cancer Pavilion, to Pavilion for 10 years. I've had one family who would have, have a TP53 mutation. So it's very uncommon to see, but we wanna make sure that we're screening those individuals appropriately. More common are some of what we call these more moderate risk gene mutations. Um, so, oh, sorry, I keep doing this. Um, so there's this gene called CHECK2 that is actually a fairly common uh, hereditary predisposition that we can see in, in individuals. That is a moderate risk gene for breast cancer and colon cancer. So individuals who have these genetic mutations, they may develop an, a, a breast cancer over their lifetime, but it's, the risks are not as high as compared to a BRCA mutation. So again, we kind of want to look at these specific mutations that individuals have, and then we can follow them uh, based on that and based on their family history. Uh, yes, there is a question back there. So I have a Sorry. So my mom was tested. Um, she was in her 80s and did not have cancer. My sister was negative, so we know she didn't get the gene. Uh, my children, my son is negative, but my daughter is positive, and she was diagnosed or was tested kind of early when she was 19, um, only because 23andMe came out and we were able to do that, and she was wanted to be tested. So she's now 29. 
Um, unfortunately, she lives in Australia, so I don't know if they have the same kind of um, services there that they do here in Long Beach. I mean, she did meet with the counseling center, so thank you. It was with, when Dr. Cullinane was here. And rest, you know, she was assured that just because she has a mutation did not guarantee that she would get cancer. So that was, you know, a positive. Yeah. But trying to figure out, you know, what, what is her protocol? Because, you know, she doesn't have any um, experience there now of 29. She hasn't had her first mammogram yet. I said they, they said to wait at least to 27, I think it is, or something. Yeah. So. Um, well, and uh, yes, international genetic counseling is a little bit different. So here in the United States, we have our own guidelines in Australia and England and uh, parts of Asia. They have different guidelines. Um, and so my best advice would be, um, you can circle back with me, uh, email me. I can see if there are genetic counselors in her area in Australia uh, to hook up and, and make sure that she kind of gets into whatever kinds of programming there are. There are genetic counselors all over the world, um, definitely more in the United States and Canada than there are anywhere else, but there definitely are genetic counselors in Australia and other parts of the world. And so especially because we do have international families. There are individuals who get tested in the United States, but then they have family members all over the world. We want to be able to utilize that information appropriately. So come in. Uh, uh, I'll give you my uh, email address after this, and we'll make sure that we can get her hooked up to the right place. Yes. So, uh, and can you tell me your name, please? Charlotte had just asked, it's her understanding that her daughter can inherit a BRCA gene from her father. So um, again, kind of thinking back to those high school science days, you might remember that everybody gets two copies of a gene. You get one copy of a gene from your mom, one copy of a gene from your dad. And when someone has their own children, they separate these genes up into either separate egg cells or separate sperm cells. And then every parent only donates one out of two genes. Um, so you, it's kind of a flip of the coin chance which gene gets passed on to the child. If a father has a BRCA mutation, yes, he has the potential that he could pass that on to any child that he has. So there's a 50% chance that a father can pass that on to a child if the father has a BRCA mutation, but it's not common to carry BRCA mutations or other mutations. And so that's where family history can be helpful. If somebody has a family history and they have multiple generations of cancers, if they have cancers at younger ages, if they have unusual cancers in their family, those are the places that is a good idea to ask about genetic testing uh, underlying hereditary causes. And then if you do identify a genetic cause, then that can be kind of a point to look at from generation to generation. If there isn't a family history of cancer within the family, it's less likely that the paternal line or any line would have a mutation if we don't see family histories that kind of go along with that. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes, as uh, uh, I think you had mentioned your name was Jackie, is that correct? As Jackie had mentioned, her mom it was in her 80s. She's the one who carried a BRCA mutation, and she hadn't developed a cancer. So just because somebody has a predisposition for cancer, it doesn't mean you are going to develop a cancer. Um, and so that can be a little bit tricky. Um, and so individuals who are of Ashkenazi Jewish or European Jewish ancestry, regardless of if you have cancer in your family, you actually could qualify for genetic testing, so it's something you can talk to your doctors about. Um, but depending on the family history, that's when it might be something that we would potentially recommend genetic testing for and examinations for. So it's, it's very specific family, family to family, unfortunately. We're going to take two more questions. And I'll be here after, so I'm happy to right, answer Right, and questions. you can find, so I'm, we're going to start with this person here in the back, and then I'll come to you. All right, maybe we'll take three more questions. All right. but, you know, twist, twist my arm. Okay. Why? 
Um, that's a great question. That is a question that I unfortunately do not know the answer to. Uh, definitely something that you can ask uh, maybe some of your medical oncologists uh, to see if there are any studies. So um, there are certain types of cancers that we do see in populations, uh, certain populations. So um, certain types of lung cancers we see uh, can see sometimes in Asian females without a, sm a smoking history. Um, I do not know if there are studies that are going on as to why that is happening. As far as we see, we don't see it you know, in that generation to generation category. So it's potential that maybe there could be some underlying small genetic component, but maybe not a huge hereditary cause for that. Um, but I don't know of any studies available. Thank you. OK, who else had their hand up? So we'll get to you. Yes? Hi, my name is Flori. And um, I have two sons, so I don't have any daughters. Uh, but when I look at the screen, I'm seeing all the kinds of different cancers. And in my family history, there was no breast cancer, but there was melanoma and colon cancer. Um, how early should I get my sons tested for, and can they get tested? And if I was, if the insurance company doesn't obviously um, allow them to get tested and I can pay for it, uh, can you make comments about what I could do? Mm -hmm. proactively? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we think about genetic testing, germline genetic testing for these hereditary causes, um, we can, uh, the first thing is if we can test someone who we identify as the most informative family member, that is the individual that we would prefer to start off with genetic testing first. So kind of thinking about our genes as like apples on an apple tree. Um, if we see all of these red apples, um, but then only three of those apples are orange or yellow, you know, why are those three apples yellow? I don't want to test a red apple to figure that out. I want to test a yellow apple to figure that out. Um, and so that's how our families work too. When we see family histories and there is an individual who's had a cancer and that cancer could be due to a hereditary cause, we try to test that individual who's been affected with cancer first, if we can. If that test comes back negative, then we've kind of ruled out any hereditary cause, and there wouldn't be a need for children to do genetic testing, but we still want them to be screened for the cancers that we see within their family, because we still can't explain cancer within a family with negative testing. And so we would want, if there is a family history of colon cancer, of skin cancers, make sure that you get hooked up with a gastroenterologist, make sure that you get hooked up with a dermatologist, even though we cannot find an underlying hereditary cause for that. But if that informative person tests positive, now we know what specific gene we're looking at, we know what specific mutation we're looking at, and the testing can become a little bit more kind of categorized. Yes, this individual carries that mutation and we need to follow them differently versus no, you don't have the mutation that was found within your family and you don't need to be screened differently. So that's when genetic counselors and genetics professionals can help. Um, when you have these kind of specific situations within your family, um, the, in, most insurances do cover the consultation with a genetic counselor. There are a few uh, exceptions in terms of Medicare. So currently, genetic counselors are not considered health care providers by CMS, which is the body that under, see, oversees uh, Medicare. And so unfortunately, Medicare and patients who have TRICARE or straight Medi-Cal, they can't get their genetic counseling appointment covered by their insurance but most other insurances will cover the genetic counseling appointment. At that point in time, after you meet with a genetic counselor, they can determine if you yourself might meet your insurance criteria to do that next step of genetic testing. And even if you don't meet your insurance criteria, they can still offer you the cash price pay. So they'll, they can walk you through step by step in terms of what that means for you and what that means for family. Thank you, Karen. We have one final question with Marsha before we go to lunch. And Renee, we are not, not everyone is leaving for lunch at once. I'm just going to let you know we're going to be excusing you row by row. But first, the final question from Marsha. Hi. Uh, in uh, 2016, I was diagnosed with bladder cancer. Uh, when, um, 
I had my uh, genetic testing done in 2007 and 2018 because I found out that out of uh, 12, uh, 10 of my first cousins, five of us had bladder cancer. Can it be retested? They said it wasn't definitive, that it was, uh, um, that it was hereditary, but they said in the future it might be. Has that been diagnosed now or? Yeah, so, um, you know, if we think about all of the different types of cancers and uh, our progress that we're making in terms of genetic testing, I would say, you know, if you've probably had testing 2017 and onwards, most likely the advancements in that germline genetic test aren't going to change too significantly currently. Um, so for the most part, if people have kind of had these comprehensive multi-gene panels, and, you know, 2016, 2017, and onwards, the testing hasn't changed too significantly uh, since then. But definitely keep that into the back of your mind. And I would definitely say in the next two years, five years, maybe there could be more information for you and your providers. Um, thank you so much. I will be here. I'm in the table in the back. You can come and find me. And I think I gave brochures, maybe, or cards. I have cards, but um, if we, you have questions. We have flyers. We flyers. have flyers. There are right flyers. Over here. So you guys can find me. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find at the Todd Cancer Pavilion. Good afternoon, survivors and supporters. First, I want to acknowledge my husband, who is a 23-year cancer survivor and probably my best supporter in everything I've done. He's really supported everything I do. And the ladies from my breast cancer support group, you over there, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here to celebrate this wonderful event to all of you. I'm here to, today speaking to you because I facilitate the Life After Cancer support group at the Cancer Support Community. This is a group for people who understand what it's like to go through cancer and complete treatment. Nobody can really understand what it's like unless they've been there. Today is a special day for me. One year ago today, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Thank goodness it was benign and it was surgically removed, and it's gone. Yeah. Don't make me cry. <laughs> it was not a welcome visitor, and because I have quite a sense of humor, which the ladies in my group know, I named it Tubby the Tumor. <laughs> All I can say is, bye-bye, Tubby. My first experience with cancer was six weeks before my 12th birthday. My mom was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, and the world of cancer was so different back in the 1960s. I couldn't understand when she would get an ache or a pain and why she would worry it was cancer. As a teenager, I would do the eye roll when I heard her say, could this be cancer? But as an adult who has worked in the field of cancer for 25 years, I can sure get it now, and there are no more eye rolls. I've learned so much from my participants in my cancer support groups. I'm so lucky to be associated with such a fabulous organization, the Cancer Support Community South Bay. Many years ago, I was in the military performing combat stress testing before the soldiers were deployed. My metaphor of this experience is with a cancer diagnosis, you are on the front lines of combat where cancer can be the enemy if you let it. After all the years working with cancer patients, there are many things I've learned. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but here are the, some of the things you have taught me. It starts with when you hear the words, you have cancer. For so many people, life looks different after a diagnosis, even when declared cancer free. There are several themes that arise when we talk about the cancer journey. A big one is the fear of recurrence. 
There are many of us that like to be in control, and we know who we are, <laughs> and cancer can take away that aspect of who we are. Another theme is grief and loss. The loss can be anything from a body part to the loss of support and attention one gets while going through treatment. This is where we can be confronted with a loss of control. If one has gone through chemotherapy, they have said that chemo brain lingers and because of lingering side effects, there's a lack of energy and things just aren't the same. And we all know that. PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder can occur because of lingering after effects and emotions that surface. A big theme is scanxiety. That's when fear and anxiety surfaces about what am I going to hear when I get the results of my latest test? I bet most of us can relate to that one, me included. Other topics or themes are questions such as, did I cause this or could I have prevented this? A very serious discussion revolves around mortality and the reality of death. Now, let's move on to how people have found meaning after a cancer diagnosis. Looking around this room with over 100 survivors, you can all tell lots of stories of how you did it. It's a thrill to see so many faces celebrating survivorship, and I honor all of you. Over the past few weeks, I asked my participants, who are both men and women, what they wanted me to tell the audience as to how they reinvented themselves or if they even made any changes at all. Here is what they had to say. There are so many ways people have reinvented or not reinvented themselves, but I'm only going to go over a few. One of the biggest realizations is that work is not as important as family time or traveling or taking personal time to enjoy life. It's now okay to say no. If I really don't want to do something or be with people that are not healthy for me to be around, they choose who they want to be around even though we know this isn't always possible. This is not selfish, it is self-love. One gentleman told me he doesn't put things off and he has learned to mellow out and be more empathic towards others. Many people said they want to have more purpose in life and have intentions and live with more gratitude. This goes hand in hand in being more in tune to their body. A sense of normalcy or a new normalcy can be regained and there is hope and a life can be reclaimed. We have choices to be a victim or a victor. We have choices in how to stand up to the diagnosis. We are so fortunate to have good medical care and wonderful organizations that offer support and knowledge. In closing, I would like to quote Viktor Frankl, one of my heroes, a psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor. And he said, to choose one attitude in any given set of circumstances is to choose one's own way. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to speak to you. Any comments or questions? And thank you all. Thanks for hanging in there after you ate your delicious Blueberry Hill lunches and you really just want to get home and take a Saturday afternoon nap. So thanks for not scooting out the back door. And because I know that and the nap sounds good, I'm going to pack this next 15 minutes or so with the most value that I can for you. So my intention, my goal is that when you leave this room today, you have the new space in your mind and in your life, and you have a tool to fill that space with what I believe is the foundation of a healthy, happy life. And that is self-compassion. So I'd like to start with a little survey. Randall kind of did this in the beginning, but I have a little spin on it. So 
If you are in this room because you love someone who has or has had cancer, let me see your hand. All right, thank you. Now, if you're in this room because you have or have had cancer, let me see your hand. Lots, yeah. So I want to ask you a question. If you raised your hand to the second question, but not to the first, so let me restate the first. Are you in this room because you love someone who has or has had cancer? And if you didn't raise your hand to both of those questions, I'd like you to think about why. Now, why weren't you the one who came to your mind as someone you love and are here to support? Now, it's a little bit of a trick question, I'll give you that, <laughs> but I ask it to illustrate a really important point. I have been coaching breast cancer survivors for the past six years. And in that time, without fail, 100% of the clients that come to me struggle with the ability to love themselves. They struggle with the ability to treat themselves with kindness and compassion. They struggle to embrace their own sense of worth, their own value in this world and in their life. Now, they are amazing at being there for everybody else. They're wonderful about serving everyone else's needs, but they're not so amazing at identifying and caring for their own needs. And in fact, I see this so often that I've given it a name, and I call it the giving tree syndrome. So who's familiar with the Shel Silverstein children's book, The Giving Tree, right? Okay, Cliff Notes version. In this book, the tree loves this little boy so much. It gives the little boy its fruit, its shade, its leaves, its branches, its trunk. It gives and it gives and it gives and the little boy takes and takes and takes everything that tree has to give until there's nothing left of that tree but a stump. And then the little boy who is now a man uses that stump as a stool to sit on. Now I encourage my clients and I would like to encourage everyone in this room today, don't be the giving tree. Don't do that to yourself. We give to people because we love to give. We love to show up for the people that we care about. But there are times when we are depleted, when we don't want to go do the thing, when we don't have the energy to show up at the place. But we do it anyway, and we do it at a cost to ourselves. We do it not in support of our own needs. Now, I understand that it's challenging. It's challenging to begin to practice self-compassion and to treat yourself as a priority. And I ask my own clients, share with me some of the things that come up with you when you're struggling to treat yourself with self-love, to treat yourself as a priority. And I will hear things that range from, honestly, I've never even thought about that, to I have no idea what I need. I have no idea what I want. I've never even given it time because I can't make time for myself. Somebody else always needs something from me. Now, I think it's an important thing to think about here because it's up to us to set the standard for how we want to be cared for. It's up to us to set the standard for others to show them how we want and deserve to be loved. So I want to share a little story with you to illustrate this because the beautiful thing is it doesn't have to be like that. So I have an amazing client. She's a wonderful lady. She's been with me for three years. And she's been diagnosed with breast cancer three times. Now, she came to me after, shortly after her first diagnosis, and she had just finished chemotherapy. And she came to me because she wanted to develop a plan to support herself and to be able to support her body as she went through this very challenging breast cancer radiation treatment. So we get on the Zoom call. And she's super cute. I call her Sunshine because she's always so happy. And she's like, Laura, I've given this a lot of thought, and I have a plan. I said, awesome. OK, share it with me. What you got? And she says, OK, so the hospital that I'm going to go get treated at is really close to the office that I work at. So I figured out, because the doctor wants me to have radiation every day, and they like you to come at about the same time every day, I could go on my lunch break. And that way I could be back in the office by the end of lunch before anybody needs anything from me. And I was confused because she seemed really happy with this plan. And I said, okay, so can you help me understand how this plan 
best supports you and your ability to support your body. And she sat there in silence for a second, and she said, oh my God, I am trying to squeeze cancer treatment into my lunch hour so I don't inconvenience anybody else. And that was a really pivotal moment for her because it was one of the first times that she shifted the way she thinks from how am I supposed to show up in the world for everybody else to how do I show up for myself? And that changed that trajectory of her ability to practice self-compassion. It changed the way she looked at why she deserved love. And now she's still my client. She's in treatment for metastatic breast cancer. But she does not squeeze her infusions into her lunch hours. Now that she's completely reframed the way she looks at life and the way she looks at what she deserves. So when she knows there's an infusion coming up, she asks questions that sound more like, how is this going to affect me? What are my difficult days going to be? What kind of food supports my body while I'm going through that? How much hydration am I going to need? What comfort items make me feel good as I'm going through this? And how much time ahead of the infusion do I need to get that ready because I know I won't feel good enough to do those things for myself after the treatment? So she takes this time to show up for herself because she realizes that she deserves that kind of love. She's completely reframed the way that she treats herself. So cancer is this critical point in our life, and it's an opportunity for us to stop and look back at our life and the way we've been conditioned to think about ourselves and the way we've been conditioned to treat ourselves for our whole life. And we get to ask ourselves in that moment, do I love the way I'm living? And if I do, what do I love about it? What would I like to change about it? What would I like my life to look like in a month from now, in three months from now, in a year from now, in the coveted five years from now? What do I want my life to look like? And when we do that, when we start asking ourselves questions like that, it can get a little uncomfortable. You might feel some discomfort. You might feel some fear bubble to the surface. You might even feel anxious because we don't know how to show up for ourselves. Nobody tells us it's okay for us to take care of ourselves first, except the flight attendant when she says, grab the oxygen when the plane's going down in flames, right? <laughs> and we don't want to wait that long, okay? We deserve to be taken care of. So I want to walk you through a little bit of an exercise. This is something I do with my clients when we're exploring how they're using their time to create the life that they want to live. So let's think about, call to mind your top five priorities in life. Some, most of us will say family, some will say God, some will say friends, and I really hope everybody in this room has health in those top five priorities. And if you don't, I'm sitting right over there. Come and talk to me when we're done. So let's call to mind those five priorities. And now think about one of the most valuable assets you have in your life, which I believe is time. Now we all have access to this really valuable currency. We all have exactly the same amount of it, 24 hours in a day. So when we think about those very precious 24 hours, are they in alignment with the five most important things in your life? Do you spend most of your time on the things that mean the most to you? And if you don't, it's okay because it's a beautiful time to begin to explore and ask yourself the questions, why am I living my life the way that I'm living my life right now? Why am I choosing this? So my husband, or let me first start here and say there was a little bit of a shift, right? Are we talking about self-compassion? Are we talking about time management? And we're talking about both, because if self-compassion is the foundation for a healthy life, then time management, which my clients and I call purposeful planning, is the ability to create space to nurture that self-compassion, is to create the space to understand what you need, what you want, and to develop a future focus for your life. So my husband, hi honey, Vaughn, thank you for waiting till the end of the day. <laughs> he is a very successful business coach. And I'll often hear my husband ask or say to his clients, you cannot work on your business when you are buried in your business. You've got to step back. And I think that that philosophy applies to us across our lives, all of us. 
We cannot work on our lives if we are overwhelmed in our lives. We have to have space. We have to have me time. We have to have quiet time. We have to be able to ask ourselves what our priorities are. And then we have to be able to create the space and the time to work on those priorities. So why don't we do that? Why do we sometimes choose to give our time to someone else ahead of us when we know that we really need that time for ourselves? Sometimes we do it, as I said a minute ago, because we want to show up for people. We love people. We want to be there for them. But sometimes we do it because the discomfort that we are familiar with is better than the discomfort that we're not. And what I mean by that is that when you begin to show up for yourself and establish healthy boundaries and honor those boundaries, it can feel very uncomfortable if this is something you're not used to doing. If you start saying no when you are always the person who said yes, even when you didn't want to, it can feel super awkward. And we don't like to feel awkward. And we don't like to feel uncomfortable. So we say things like, it's just easier if I do it. I had to do it. I didn't have any choice. I had to do it. Right? I hear a lot of chatter out there like, oh, yeah, I say that. OK. <laughs> right? And so here's the thing. We say that because we're used to the discomfort of feeling taken for granted. We know what that feels like. We're used to the discomfort of being a little resentful. We understand that. But we don't understand these uncomfortable vibrations in our body that come along with those new emotions when we recreate and reframe our life and we start to create positive change. So is it over committing that gets in the way of us reframing our life? I say no, it's not over committing. That's the problem. It's under feeling. That's the problem. We have got to be willing to feel all of the emotions that come with creating the life we want to live. We've got to be willing to go through the process of creating space for ourselves and using that space to cultivate self-compassion and self-love and realize what our dreams are and realize what our ambitions and hopes are. If we're not willing to do that, then that life to-do list it just kind of stays out there. It's like having a wish list in your Amazon account, right? You get the items, you get them all in the cart, and you're like, uh, I really don't want to spend the money on those right now. So you put them on the wish list, right? Yeah, I hear you. And then you visit that wish list every now and then, but you don't really do anything about it because it's there and it's hanging out. And you see it and you say, I'll get back to that one day. But then those items never show up on your doorstep because you're never willing to invest your money into getting them to that doorstep. Same thing with your life. That life to-do list, if you're not willing to spend your valuable time on that life to-do list, it will never manifest. It will never become a reality for you. So how do you do this? What is the first step? How do you begin to reframe your life? How do you begin to create space for yourself? Well, I said in the beginning, I want you to walk out of here with the thought in your mind about this new space and a tool. So I created a guide for you. It's over here by Randall on the resource table. And in that guide, there's some simple steps that will coach you through your thoughts about yourself as a priority, your thoughts about creating time for yourself. And the best way for you to do that in the whole purposeful planning. Now, when you look at it, you might think to yourself, this is really simple. I often have clients that say to me, yeah, yeah, I looked at that. I, I just kind of worked through it in my head and I tell them what I'm going to tell you. That does not cut it, OK? Working through it in your head isn't enough, because when we're just thinking about something, it's only a consideration. But when we put pen to paper, it feels different. It tells our brain, I'm making this thing more real now. And it feels a little more like a commitment at this point, which is why we avoid doing it. Because when it feels more like a commitment, we feel like we have to take action. And that's what I would like for you to do is to take action. Because I know that you can all live a life that is better than before cancer. But I also know you have to be intentional about creating it, and you have to be willing to create the space in order to build it. 
Thank you so much for having me here today. It's been my honor. Thank you.